to use from the international crisis group. Any of you who don't know the ICG uh, does fantastic work. Its work on Libya has been, I think, exceptional too. And so we look forward to hearing from you now for maximum eight to ten minutes, okay? All right. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you, Ian. Um, after Paddy Ashdown's uh, uplifting description of the uh, power shift and the conflicts that it will bring in its wake, I must say that as a, a person working for a conflict prevention organization, I certainly made a smart career choice. Um, we have our work cut out for us. Um, but uh, as a uh, conflict prevention organization, I think also we'll find uh, and have found already that uh, it's a very frustrating business. Um, it is very difficult to... Uh, to actually prevent conflicts and sometimes we actually encourage conflicts or interventions in order to improve situations that have uh, reached their nadir as you could argue in Libya and in fact and in Iraq and in Afghanistan and many other places um, where governance has ground to a halt and people have been disenfranchised um, and economies uh, essentially have uh, have uh, gone to the dogs um, now I want to talk about Libya a little bit because that's what I was asked to do. Um, I should uh, immediately say that I'm personally not a Libya expert. I'm an Iraq expert and that should help. But, um, uh, but my organization has some institutional knowledge about Libya. We have an ongoing program there. We have a uh, person on the ground. Um, we have a report out uh, published in December which you can find on our website www.crisisgroup.org. I just want to uh, highlight some of the issues that uh, emerged from our, our research there in the, since August um, and, uh, and, and reinforce some of the points that Sean has, has rightly made. Um, you know, Libya is, as no other country, it, it, this, it has a set of problems that are unique uh, because of its own unique uh, composition, makeup, history, etc., etc. Uh, it is not Iraq, uh, it is not Afghanistan. Uh, even without the international intervention, which was done so differently in the Libyan case, it's an entirely different. There, it's an entirely different place, and that means that the the problems that we face, or the problems that the Libyans face, is is a different set of problems that the Iraqis faced, or continue to face, in fact. Um, <laughs> and it's a different set of problems that the inter com international community faces. So we need to look at the place as a unique place, but it doesn't mean we cannot learn lessons from other uh, places, but we have to be very careful in applying them. I say this because, for example, the Bosnia model is still being used as a template for Iraq, and I think foolishly um, and, uh, and, and, and very dangerously. Um, and so there's a tendency to do it, and there's a, there's a whole, I, I'm, a, I'm a specialist on Iraq, but there is a whole community out there of people who move from, from uh, conflict to conflict, almost like ambulance chasers, I would say, because I'm, I like specialization, <laughs> but they would not see it, of course, that way, and, and of course, they, uh, they are very serious in their business, and in fact, they're very qualified. But um, they, they also, one of the, the, the drawbacks of it is that they, they often see their pa the, the lessons from their past conflict and think, hey, that worked very well, let's apply it. But it actually requires some, some very intense study to see whether uh, this is applicable at all. And it's very dangerous to apply the wrong model. Now, in Libya, I'd say the key issue right now is the uh, state of fragmentation. Um, I guess that's a contradiction in terms. There is no state. Uh, but there's a state of a condition of fragmentation uh, that is really based on how the revolution took place. Um, it was a, a localized revolution that succeeded, first of all, in Benghazi, in the eastern part of the country. Um, and because Benghazi was so far ahead of the other areas of the country, especially in the west and, of course, the capital Tripoli, um, you saw the emergence there of an interim authority. And that interim authority uh, had no control over the rest of the country and tried to govern as best as it could with very few resources because it had no access to state uh, funds um, in that particular area. What it was particularly good at was to gain international legitimacy, but not local one or not national one. Um, but that was important as well because without international legitimacy the intervention wouldn't have occurred the way it did um, and uh, it would not have received the kinds of funds that it did um, which helped it in both uh, governing and uh, pushing forward the, 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 the so-called national army uh, on its way to Tripoli. Um, but the fight 
took place in different areas at different times. Misrata, a town on the Mediterranean, had it particularly bad uh, with horrific uh, violence uh, with many people killed. And until this day, the rebels that emerged really from the civil from civilian base at that time um, take credit for bringing the regime to an end and saying that they, as the people who suffered the most, ought to have the most prominent positions in the security apparatus of the new state and also in the, in the political sphere. But that claim is challenged. It's challenged by the people from Zintan who arrived in Tripoli uh, on the morrow of the, uh, of the revolution in Tripoli, which was actually a civilian revolution. It wasn't a, guer a guerrilla takeover, a rebel takeover. It was, uh, it was the people of Tripoli who uh, on, I think it was August 23rd, maybe it might have been the 22nd, I'm not very good with dates, but um, essentially rose up and overthrew the regime. The regime melted away in most places, stayed hunkered down in some areas, of course in the palace uh, and in some neighborhoods. Then the rebels came in right after that because they realized what was going on and there was some planning um, and then militarily got rid of the regime in those areas and then it took another couple of months to, to essentially eradicate that regime. Um, but all of these uh, guerrilla groups now have a claim to power and they all think that they have the prime claim. Ben Ghazi because it was the first to have the revolution, Mesrata because it suffered the most, Zintan because it was in Tripoli arrived first and uh, uh, did this and that. Um, uh, and there's others. This is only the, the three main ones that I mentioned. There is now a, a, a Tripoli uh, military council headed by Abdul Hakim Ben, ha ben, ha ben Hajj. Um, who, who was supported by Qatar, who, who immediately took charge of one particular piece of the pie. All of these are competing, and there is no legitimate, recognized national authority that is able to impose its will. There is a national authority. It just cannot impose its will because it, doesn't, it lacks the legitimacy. That is the, the, the National Transitional Council, the NTC. Um, and the challenge now is going to be to legitimize the governing structure of the new Libya and bringing together these various militias into a national army. Now this is a generational project. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, and this is going to be the biggest challenge. Um, because meanwhile, because these militias are in control of their own areas and people want services, you see also the emergence of local councils. And you get a decentralization by default. Now, there's nothing wrong with decentralization, but it's got to be managed. And in the absence of a national government that can impose its will and has legitimacy and has access to state funds and can run the oil industry, which accounts for 90% of Libya's uh, budget, um, you're going to have a very dysfunctional place. And so I think uh, this is the, the main challenge now. There is an additional challenge, which is uh, because these are intersecting uh, problems. You have the sort of the militia turf wars, but you also have, which, which are centered on Tripoli, the capital, where they all come together. But you also have the, the conflict between the old and the called the old and what I call the new slash young. Uh, the old meaning the old regime, but also the old generations. And then the, the new generation that was uh, uh, out in the forefront. Um, uh, but also the, uh, and, and the young who were uh, particularly doing it, but, but the ones who ha are now in power, and, and the young who are not yet in power, but who were really the, the main uh, uh, fomenters of the, of the revolution. And this conflict um, is going to take place, and it's taking place throughout the, the Arab world, in fact, but in Libya, one interesting sort of development now that is crystallizing this particular conflict is the new draft electoral law because the electoral law does not allow for political parties. Now, Libya doesn't have an experience of, Libyan, uh, of political parties. And I, I, before we, we entered the room, I made a, sort of a joke. Because Jordan doesn't have a political parties law either. And you know, it has, uh, doesn't, didn't go through this kind of crisis. So uh, whatever. The, but at the same time, what the absence of the ability to create political parties for the purpose of elections means is that the electoral law essentially is going to re-encourage, re-emphasize, reassert the power of traditional patronage networks, especially the tribes, um, which ha had been sidelined in an, what is essentially an urban society such as Libya. Um, and that is going to have consequences. So final word, because I've run out of time, I think, is um, what, what is the international community's role going to be in all of this? Having 
assisted in the overthrow of the regime, not having done it itself, but assisted it, which was an interesting twist, and, and I think a positive one. Is it going to abandon uh, Libya? Is it going to say, well, this is for Libyans to decide, and then, you know, uh, may, uh, you know let's see what happens? Um, because what may happen is something that will be adversarial to the interests of the international community. Things could get out of hand. So the international community cannot just abandon Libya. But it certainly will have to defer to the sovereignty of Libya, to the sovereignty of the people, and to the will of the people. Libyans will have to take the first step and to make very clear what it is uh, they want. But Libya is, is, is extremely dysfunctional, it's fragmented, it's going to take time, it's, and it's going to require patience on the part of everyone. And I think for the United Nations to be involved with its technical capacity is very important. Um, but it should be at, at, at the urgings of, and, and at the request of the, of the Libyans. Um, but the international community should be there to offer help and to suggest ways in terms of rule of law, creation of rule of law, independent judiciary, things like that, uh, capacity building, professionalization of the security forces, uh, human rights training, things like that. Not all of this will be requested by the Libyans, but these are the things that the international community can offer, at least. That's where I wanted to keep it, uh, but just to um, add on to what uh, Paddy Ashdown said about sort of the more, the, the more international situation, I want to signal two points that I don't want to discuss, but maybe can be discussed later. Uh, one is, is the, the impact of the uh, Libya uh, intervention on the uh, responsibility to protect and what it means in the case of, of Syria uh, and, and, and other places. In the, in the case of Syria, there is clearly a lot of pushback against the way um, the, uh, the principle was applied in, uh, in Libya. And even some people who support the, the responsibility to protect are now cri have become critical of it because of the sense that it was applied in Libya uh, with false pretenses. The, uh, the second issue is a more sociological one, and one that is very dear to our heart as, as international crisis group working in the Middle East and North Africa, which is the, um, the interesting outcome of the Arab Springs, which was very much fomented by a young, mostly secular, uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook using uh, youth uh, seems to be the rise of the only organized and disciplined political group in the region, which is the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and we see throughout the region, including in Libya, including in Morocco, which didn't even have much of an Arab Spring, but preemptively went to elections where the Muslim Brotherhood won, um, in Tunisia, where the Muslim Brotherhood won in elections, in Egypt, where we've seen the same, um, and, uh, and uh, in, in Yemen, uh, uh, playing a very prominent role, and in, in Syria is bound to play a role, and the role of countries like Qatar and Turkey, which both have an interest in this, uh, in promoting this, this shift. So yeah. in terms of power shifts, here is one for you, and let's look at the conflicts that will follow in its wake. Yus, thank you very much.